Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. We have to remember that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not natural weapons, but they are spiritual weapons and praise and worship and gratitude and giving and all of those things are spiritual warfare. You will like tonight's message. I don't have to wonder if you will. I already know that you will. Because it's called the battle belongs to the Lord. See, I told you you'd like it. Everybody loves that message. The battle belongs to the Lord. But I do want to mention right up front that just because the battle belongs to the Lord, that doesn't mean that you just get to sit down and do nothing <laughs> while God does absolutely everything. You know, God wants to see humility before he gets involved in solving our problems. God helps the humble and he resists the proud. He helps the humble, he resists the proud. And the proud is somebody who thinks they can do it and they don't need God. Now, yeah, oh my, you're right. Now, and sometimes we think because we've done something successfully 200 times before that now we're getting up to do it for the 201st time and we don't need God this time because look at how practiced we are. You know, it would scare me silly to get up in this pulpit and try to say anything to any of you that made any sense if I wasn't totally dependent on God when I got up here. Remember what I'm saying, the humble get the help. God resists the proud. Let me show you in 1 Peter 5, B, it's the last part of the scripture. It says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Tie on a servant's apron, for God is opposed to the proud. <laughs> the disdainful, the presumptuous, and that's somebody who thinks they don't need God. And he defeats them, but he gives grace to the humble. So God opposes, frustrates, and defeats all of our efforts that are done in pride until we humble ourselves, and then and only then will he help us. God, I'm not capable of doing this. I wouldn't know what to do even if I tried, but my eyes are on you. I know you can do what I cannot do. And there's some of you that need to hear that tonight. You need to know that just because you have not been able to do it, that certainly does not mean that God is not able to do it, and he's been waiting for you to find that out. Maybe some of you have kind of lost hope because your thing hasn't been working. Oh, we pray these prayers. Well, God, I've just tried everything and I don't know what you want me to do. <laughs> well, that's the point. Everything you've tried isn't working, so maybe he doesn't want you to do anything for a few minutes. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And he said, a broken off branch withers and has no strength of life. A great example, Pastor, in a teaching, sometime, especially if you're doing like a, a series, is bringing a little bush and break a branch off and lay it up here and let people watch how every day it dies a little bit more and a little bit more. A branch off of the vine, which is talking about us away from Jesus. I mean, it only takes just a few days. I mean, I can do it in like a, a three or four part seminar. And I mean, by the time you get to the last day, that thing is crispy and wrinkled up and has no life in it. And it, it makes a great example. 
No wonder Jesus said the broken off branch withers up and dies. And you see, that's what happens to us. Let me tell you something. You need God more than you need what he can do for you. Don't start your time with God with requests. Start with gratitude. Think about the people that God's put in your life that are a blessing to you. Don't start with telling him everything that hurts. Thank him for the things you've got that still work. Amen. Amen. I have to do that sometimes. You know, we can always find something that aches and gives us trouble. But thank God there's more that works right than what works wrong. In 12 verses, Jehoshaphat got himself and all Judah in position for a miracle. It takes most of us 12 years, and then we're still like millions of miles away. <laughs> Second Chronicles 20, 13, so all Judah stood before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children, and they waited. <laughs> now, let me tell you something about waiting that you may or may not know. I always had a wrong misconception of waiting. I thought that waiting was just kind of like, had to be the most boring thing ever. And so when the devil would whisper in my ear, well, what are you going to do? I'd always come up with something. <laughs> Don't you know the enemy sends out a little demon to sit on your shoulder every day? And he whispers in your ear all day long, what are you going to do? 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 Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> and pretty soon you start feeling like you need to come up with something or you're going to look like a real dummy. <laughs> Not too long ago, I had some health problems. I had a doctor tell me that I'd worked too hard for too long and I, he gave me this thing. He wanted me for, to rest for like this long period of time. And the first, here was my first thought. This was my first thought. Well, what does one do when they rest? <laughs> and I'm still having a hard time with it. It's like, what do you do when you rest? <laughs> Thus, that's how I've written 116 books. No. One doesn't rest much. <laughs> But see, the word wait doesn't mean just sit around and just do nothing, wait for a miracle. You're not busy physically, but you're very busy spiritually. You're trusting, you're believing, you're praising. The word wait means to expect, look, and long for God. That's what the word wait means. Can you get that? To expect to look and to long for God. In Isaiah 40, 31, the scripture we all love, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. Well, waiting on God gives us the strength that we need to do whatever it is that God's gonna tell us to do. That's why many times when you go to God with a problem, he doesn't give it to you right away because you need time just in his presence, just soaking up his presence, gaining the strength and the wisdom that you're gonna need to pull off whatever it is he does show you to do. But what that means is you're not just waiting passively, doing nothing. You're, you're saying, God, I'm, I'm expecting you to speak. I'm expecting you to show up. I, I'm looking for you. I'm longing for you. You know, if I told you that I would come to your house tomorrow after I got done here uh, for supper at five o'clock, would you let me come? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm not going to, but we're playing a game. <laughs> <laughs> Only because I got to go home. But if, just, just as well as you know me, which we're not intimate, well, you know, you've watched me on TV, whatever. I mean, you probably hopefully know God a lot better than you know me. And so, uh, but when five o'clock came, you'd be looking. She, kids don't make that mess. Joyce will be here any minute. 
And see, you're going to be looking, and you're going to be excited, and you're going to be waiting. And that's what it means to look for God. We, we, we expect. You know, the word hope, I love the word hope. I wrote a whole book called Get Your Hopes Up. I call it my happy book. And it, to hope means to expect that at any moment something amazing is going to happen in your life. It's not some silly kind of like hope like the world has. Well, I hope something happens. It's not like that. So, 2 Chronicles 20, 2 Chronicles, Chronicles 20, 13. So all Judah stood before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. Nothing brings the worst out of us like a good weight. <laughs> Pastor said, you can say that again. It does. I mean, if you want to find out what's really in you, <laughs> just get into something with God and have him make you wait about six months for an answer or to where you feel like he's a million miles away and you're never going to hear from God again. By the way, let me just throw this out. The longer you walk with God, the less feelings you're likely to have. You didn't, some of you didn't get it, did you? <laughs> In other words, the longer you walk with God, the more he expects you to walk by faith. Yeah. And not by signs and wonders and confirmations <laughs> and miracles. <laughs> you know, if God tells you to put $1,000 in the offering tomorrow, you don't need three confirmations. I'll give them to you. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> I remember back when I was, I mean, I was just brand new at all this. So 40 years ago, I felt like God wanted me to give some girl $10. And I was like, now God, if you really want me, if, <laughs> I, I mean, God, if, you, if it's really you, if you really want me to do this, God. Because, see, I was really hoping it really wasn't him because I really wanted to keep my 10 bucks. <laughs> and I was just learning how to hear from God, and I heard him speak in my heart and say, you know, Joyce, even if I'm not really telling you, I won't get mad at you if you bless somebody. <laughs> So see, you don't need a confirmation to do something good for somebody. You don't need a confirmation to be nice to somebody. When you're expecting to hear from God, don't always be looking for some huge, supernatural, big explosion. <laughs> All right, let's go back. <laughs> Nothing brings the worst out of us like a good weight. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to get to the part you all love. Second Chronicles 20, 14, and 15. Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jeiel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph. I wonder if these people were around today if they would have as hard a time pronouncing our names. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now Mike here, he's, he's better at a lot of this stuff than I am. So I'll ask him how to, pro how to pronounce names, and then I forget by the time I get up here anyway. So <laughs> anyway, he said, Listen carefully, all you people of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. The Lord says this to you. First of all, it's good that Jehoshaphat was humble enough to listen to the prophet. God didn't give him the word directly. He gave it to somebody else to give to him. <laughs> Be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Now you can clap and make noise. Take your position, stand still, and see the deliverance of the Lord. 
okay, well, what is your position? You know, I, I never was real clear about that, but if you keep reading, it becomes very obvious. Go down against them tomorrow. So we clearly see here he gave them something to do, but it was after they waited, and it was not until he spoke to them. Behold, they will come up against you by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley, of the river valley, in front of the wilderness of Jeurel. You need not fight in this battle. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to go down there and stand and look at all these people. <laughs> and I'm not going to fight. Take your positions, stand and witness salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Now, they needed some faith for this journey, wouldn't you say so? I want you to watch what happened. See, they, they had experience with God. They knew what their position was. Second Chronicles 20, 18 and 19. Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping him. So we got to get this picture. Mike, can you come up and be the Jehoshaphat? I get the younger people to do the bowing. <laughs> so now here we've got Jehoshaphat, the big guy. He's bowing down with his face to the ground. Okay, so <laughs> that's his position in battle. That's his battle position, okay? And then there's all kinds of other people running around worshiping God. And it says, the Levites from the sons of the Kohathites and the sons of the Kohorites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. So some of them got really loud about their praise. Can you ever get loud about your praise? A friend of mine, she still works for me. She's worked there just about as long as I have. She, uh, she always had terrible fear in her life. And one day she got so fed up with it, she was on the highway and she rolled her window down and stuck her head out the window and screamed at the top of her lungs, praise the Lord. And she said that broke off of her and she didn't have a problem with it after that. <laughs> See, Jehoshaphat, yeah, he's been there a while. <laughs> Second Chronicles 20, 21. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised to put on their priestly attire. And they went out before the army, praise and give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. So here you got Jehoshaphat bowed down. You got people praising loud. You got people worshiping. And then you've got these singers, I don't know how many, and they're just walking around going, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Can anybody imagine this scene? And I guess the enemies are looking going. We have to remember that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not natural weapons, but they are spiritual weapons and praise and worship and gratitude and giving and all of those things are spiritual warfare. And here's the super duper good part. <laughs> when they began singing and praising, <laughs> the Lord sent ambushments against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come up against Judah, so they were struck down in defeat. Now, the classic Amplified, which they've now redone the, the Amplified Bible, but that, that used to say that the enemies were self-slaughtered. In other words, they got so stinking confused about, just imagine the devil. He's, uh, Jehoshaphat, you can get up. <laughs> he 
He'd probably have rug burn on his forehead. <laughs> now, I mean, just think about it. I mean, the enemy's throwing his best shot, and all he can get you to do is sing and worship and praise and tell God how great he is and how mighty he is and maybe give an extra big offering in the middle of it. And, and I'll tell you what, when you behave like that, God will show you if there's something he wants you to do. And if there is not something that God shows you, then be smart enough to wait until he does. I have found in my life, and I'll share this with you, I believe this with all my heart. I believe that giving, loving people through meeting needs that they have, and giving, especially when you're having trouble yourself, I think it's one of the highest forms of spiritual warfare that you can enter into. I believe every act of love helps bring healing to your body. I think every act of selfishness and hatefulness and meanness takes away our energy and eats at our, our healing and our strength. The best thing that you can possibly do is to be good to people. Did you hear me? The best thing you can possibly do is to be good to people. And I'll get into this just a little bit tomorrow, but just in case you're not going to be back here tomorrow, let me tell you something. If you need a miracle and you have got unforgiveness in your heart, you are barking up the wrong tree. Amen. Amen? Do you know how many angry people there are in church? It's sad. And a lot of them are mad at the person they came with. <laughs> and that's really bad when we do that. I know, because I used to go to church and be mad at Dave. <laughs> rant and rave all the way there, but as soon as we saw the first parking lot of 10, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> You know, we, we get it all, glory to God. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. <laughs> and I bet God is going, really, how much longer am I have to put up with you? And I mean, I would sing the songs and clap and jump up and down in church and Praise the Lord all the way out of the building. Get back in the car and fight with Dave all the way home. <laughs> Come on, how many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? Okay. <laughs> or you gossip about the pastor and his wife at lunch. <laughs> you have a sandwich with a side of pastor and his wife. And but then when you get a bad report from the doctor, man, the first thing you want to do is go get the pastor to pray for you and lay hands on you. Come on, is anybody home in the house tonight? God's got so much that he wants to do through us and for us. You seek first the kingdom of God, and all of these other things will be added unto you. Amen? All right. Well, there's a great promise in the Bible that if we seek first God's kingdom above all else in His righteousness, He will give everything that we need in every area of your life. Whatever your battle you're facing, God's gonna help you fight that battle today. You know, really, you've already won. You just need to stand firm and apply the victory that Jesus has already given us when he died on the cross. I want you to live with great expectation for good things to happen in your life.
as soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale. And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take him out of school, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home. But part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. And helping these girls by taking them into a program called Imagine Hope. If they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is, that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families, we should give. And we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does, and, and we're grateful for that. Vragen? Bel ons op. Wij zijn er voor je. Telefoonnummer 026 20 22 100.